All right, Ms. Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. I want to thank you for doing the interview with me. So, uh, how are you doing today? I am very happy to be here at the Duke Hall and James Madison University, and I'm happy to meet you and to have a conversation. It's your first time here. This is my first time here, and uh, I have been excited. Love the gallery. Love the presentation of the my work here. And, I have attended the day meeting students, meeting other members of the faculty, and visiting the campus, and it's, you guys are very privileged. This is an excellent institution. Perfect school. All right, so to get started, uh, tell me about your background, where you're from, how you got started with arts. So I was born in Cuba, and I started my involvement with art when I was very young. I was educated in a system that had the introduction to the arts when I was in elementary school. So I was uh, doing uh, performance music very, very early in my, in my life. And I went to Cuba, have a very uh, a structured uh, system of art education that go from uh, high school to college to postgraduate. And I went through all of that. And when I graduated, and then I uh, came to do studies at Mass College of Art in Boston. And then was invited later to be a professor. So I have been teaching for a number of years now as well. Okay, where are you teaching at? Uh, I teach currently at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, but I first taught at the Higher Institute of Art in Cuba, and I taught at Mass Art and Christi, and I have been visiting artists in numerous, many for me to remember now, are colleges and universities around the country and in the world. So many you just can't So many, fight. I mean, I really, I mean, I, I do uh, numerous visiting artists' presentations and talk, and uh, I, I see all over the country and all over the world. So per year, how many places do you think you oh, or different exhibitions do you Well, that is <laughs> many. I mean, uh, many depends. Sometimes it's, uh, it's nine, ten. Nine, ten? Yeah, possible. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, how did you specifically, I know you said you started with, you know, your country has a very structured environment for the arts. But besides that, what kind of pushed you in that direction? What made you focus? Was it just the fact that it's there and it's you know available to everyone, or is it something that drew you into it? Well, well I, 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 I think that uh, both. The fact that it was available, uh, definitely it has a, 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 fact, it's a factor in it. But uh, also, I think there was uh, my, my family life. I was very interested in literature, and I, I was a, very avid reader when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, my father always drew all the time in front of me. So there was this kind of a familiarity, this possibility of territory uh, Cuban itself is a play in which uh, artistic uh, uh, life and vernacular life has an incredible way is present of art. Mm -hmm. So music, dance, uh, presentation of visual material is very much in the everyday life. And I think that that was very important to me, that I was uh, used to see uh, usual uh, rituals and present they were part of everyday life in the structure of what happened in Cuba that some way somehow brought to me this uh, desire to, to get to know more uh, what the art was about and, and enter that territory. And this is kind of difficult to explain, but is that um, uh, in Cuba, music has a very vivid presence in improvisational mm -hmm. spaces. So uh, my cousins and my brother and my uncle would do you know, improvisational performance that were work of theater. Mm -hmm. But it was in, in the house, in the backyard, in a very simple way. That was, every day. Every day. That had a very a, a strong impact on me about this kind of a, Life, life that is enhanced with a very strong presence of art. Uh, in the history, too, of Cuban uh, uh, Yoruba tradition, there is Santeria, uh, there is a presentation, there is a, 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 a formal display of a stuff that is called the altar, Santeria altar, and it's really pure installation. And it's a, it's a play that I, I always say that my first encounter with installation art was that. Uh, it's a play that is heavily decorated, beautifully presented, and it has all these elements that have a, a temporality. So all those factors were very important for me. Okay. All right, uh, a lot of your interviews, the ones that I've found on the web, 
the key word that keep that kept coming up was memory. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is memory? Because even when you spoke just now, it's a lot of reoccurring thoughts that you kind of reached back to in your past that kind of seem to play a part in your art now. So how important is that? Well, um, I think that uh, memory is as, as important as you are still dealing with a issue of the present that are not resolved to the satisfaction of what we what is bad, no? And my my ins, my insistence, my my um, uh, look maybe consistently to the question of memory is about trying to uh, come to terms with issues that are affecting today. What I say, the location, the representation, and the articulation of blackness and the black body in the Western world. So I come back to take specific topics or specific uh, items from a very long archive of problems or forgotten history or no present history and trying to reinsert them. So it's not much about memory as it is about trying to understand the, the factual issues of the present mm -hmm. and trying to give what is happening in the present a context in the in the narrative of a long, long, long historical past. So I always say that me, when I talk about memory, I say, well, memory is too a, a construct. No, what I remember is memory is about the past. What you remember is not exactly what has happened. You remember something else. Yeah. No, because you only have this fragmentary, it's, it's all the thing that bits. it's broken bits. So I, I, I even use in glass because I think in glass is like memory. It's fuzzy, it's opaque, it could break, it fall apart. You need to put it together. So it's no, it, the emphasis is not in the memory. The emphasis is in the remediation that is needed to understand problems of the present. So, so I don't know if I explain that in a way that is totally clear, but it's about, it's not a fixation with the past, or it's about they are issues in the present moment that need attention. And to really resolve them, and to really understand them, we need to look at these bits that are forgotten in the packet of the past. So it's more about the present to the future. So you say the past, would you say the past is more important than the future in a way? No, no, I am thinking that the past is just an entryway to understand the present, and without doing that, you compromise the future. Yeah, just like knowing history, so it doesn't Correct, so. correct. Gotcha. In a way, I mean, that would be, the, that would be the, <laughs> the very compact way to say it, but I think not only to know your history to not repeat itself, is a find a location to insert your history in a way that is saying in a compelling and commanding way. Okay, so adding, adding to history almost, in a way. Absolutely, inserting what is not, in the writing of history, history is selective, and the writing of history is selective, and the writing of history is always from the position of power. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that are not writing in history, there are a lot of narratives that are let out. Mm -hmm. So I have been interested in what is let out, that is pertinent to my interest and pertinent to ideas that I believe that are fundamental, find a spot for that in the narrative, in the discourse. And when I say that, I'm talking about contemporary art, you know, in the discourse of contemporary art. All right, another thing that uh, kind of drew my attention was a story that you seemed to tell in one of your past uh, interviews, kind of based on memory, but it was a story about your grandfather and being not able to go back to Cuba. Uh, with everything that's going on now and you know, uh, Cuban-American relations, how is that kind of playing a part in your work now, if at all? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I work very hard to, to see in this, what happened now about Cuban-American relations, mm -hmm. being open and uh, uh, I have been loving and working for this uh, when it was even impossible. But uh, what I have to say about that, what you may remember about what I say about my uh, grand grandfather, great grandfather, was no. It's just about the, the 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 issue of exile, and the issue of separation, and the issue of um, uh, the impossibility of returning, of the of, of the argument and the effect of displacement. No, uh, I could say that my exile to um, to America from Cuba could have been voluntary, no? I ever say that exile is never voluntary, ever. There is always a reason why people left the place that they were born yeah. to, other, to venture to other shores. But um, I was, what I wanted to imply in that uh, particular response was 
that in the case of my ancestors, my great great grandfather or whatever, or this uh, group of people, the exile was not even a choice. This was a group of people that were moved by force to serve others. So it wasn't it was not an alternative. So I always say, for me, for the line of people that I belong, exile doesn't start with 1959 when Castro took power in Cuba and people came to America and <clears throat> it was a, a prohibition to return. We have a long, 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 long history of forced exile. And that is the one that I'm trying to convey at the same time. You pull into the show. Correct, uh -huh. correct. And not only into the show, in the entire, I would say, line of my work. Okay, so that's the main narrative from pretty much everything that you do. Possibly you want to put it that way. Okay. All right, well, let's start to get more focused on this show in, in, in general and talk about how this show all came together, how did you get the ideas to do mainly the installation pieces and you know more discussion about the sugar and how that plays a part in your work. Well, I mean, this show all together only being in here. Um, m mainly the pieces that are in the room that we are now, that is a very intimate, small space, uh, they are a number of uh, photographic work that is particular of a, 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 some period, they had images here that come from possible 2004 uh, to 2013 uh, in here, and they are other images that are later, 2014. But the sugar bitter sweet, which is the installation piece, uh, was a piece commissioned by, by, by a particular show at the Smith College Museum in Northampton, and it was this piece is a piece from 2010. Usually, in a piece like that, I, I work for around two years in, in the making of that piece. And it's, uh, it's, an, it's one of many pieces that I have done with a thematic uh, approach about the sugar industry. And the sugar industry was the reason why I'm having the conversation with you. <laughs> because it was a, in a specific in the Caribbean. Any people of black descent in the Caribbean, it all started when the transatlantic journey to grow people to work in the sugar industry. So that particular piece is a sort of a, a reflection and a commentary in the what I call the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of a, a, a richness that was the result of the labor of definitely people in my ancestry line. And trying to make a, a commentary in that that is both reaching back to history, both reaching back back to the archive, because I using as you know in the piece is built with original African stools that were made in Africa, and spears that were both made in Africa and China, and stools that were made both in Africa and China. And I used the, the, the architecture of the furniture from where to build the structure and accumulation of the sugar. But beside that, I have been interested for many years in the kind of proximity regarding conceptual language between sugar, uh, the, the, the denomination of sugar, in different forms, and one form that sugar is denominated is called crystallina. Sugar crystallina, like sugar as glass. Okay. And that they are a proximity in the formal appearance of sugar and glass that is very, very close. So in the accumulation of the, the stack of sugar, they are just a position of both sugar, glass, glass, sugar, you don't, you don't, you could even differentiate it. And both, and in that piece too, I was making a commentary about race because in Cuba, and the production of sugar is from very dark to very refined white. And the refiner that the sugar get, the expensive, and the more well that the sugar produce. And the power type. And the power. So it's almost like a, it's like a, a comparative a, a metaphor about race and class and all of the strata and hierarchy and all of that. So it, 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 in some way, it's a, com a composite of everything that is in the tonality of the skin in Cuba, darker, um, mestizo, uh, white. And also, I was, I, when I was talking earlier about that with the students, uh, I used one piece that is almost um, green, a little bit of greenery, and it's, uh, it's the color of the, 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 the juice of the sugar that is called guarapo. And guarapo is from where sugar is made after it's you know, boiled and processed for, for a long time. So it's both a piece about my memory of the beauty of the sugar fields, um, because it's organized in a way that how the fields are presented, which are a straight line of plantation of sugar to the side, a, a, a street in the middle, it's called Guadaraya, fields and fields, so you always surrounded by 
tall grass, no? Because sugar is sugar cane is fundamentally a tall grass. Yeah. And so the, the installation tried to refer to, as a drawing to those aspects too of the of the of the of the plant itself, the field itself and the history. So this is called sugar bitter sweet because I, I deal with both very pleasant memory of my youth in Cuba and playing and being in the field and a very dark side of sugar and, and, and all these terrible scenes. One, one idea that I repeat is that I interview a number of people about one single question. What, when you think of sugar, what comes to your mind? And I remember having a conversation with a Brazilian woman who told me that she remembered in Brazil when sugar is produced as well that um, a lot of people get blind by being cut with the leaf of the sugar or the grass because it's very sharp and with the intense light in the, of the tropic in the morning you may don't see the, 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 the leaf coming and so it's the wind I guess correct and the light it kind of disoriented the, the workers it's a very heavy work dangerous and dangerous and so it's both referring to place, site, history, Africa, China, but also all these other very s s layers of nuances of different ideas. Okay, and another question going off the stools, how do you actually go about positioning them as far as certain ones have a stool that's elevated, some are at the bottom, you have certain stacks of sugar, whether they're located towards the top or the bottom, how do you go about figuring out how to set well, that up. I, I look at them, I think that I use a lot of a, a pattern of color. You know, like I use a stack of dark molasses and a stack of dark sugar and a stack of a dark and, and, and mixed mulatto and a stack of white. And then I use this tool almost like architecture. You know, they are both in the bottom, sometimes in the middle, but it's literally, they are always in, 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 in embedded. Mm -hmm and in tango with the stack of, of sugar. And I was talking too about uh, complicity, no? Uh, those stools repre perhaps represent, I think, Africa, and I say the trade was a complicity act. It was with the participation of local African as well that uh, we ended here, mm -hmm. <laughs> to all oh, the people that I, in my ancestral line, we ended here, but uh, this is all uh, very complex uh, uh, nuances. And I am trying to do it in a way that is uh, both uh, talking truth, so it is possible, but evocative. So uh, they are as much as a drawing gesture, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, as they are, you know, reflection of historical juncture and how one could read it. Okay. And based on what's going off the sugar itself, uh, seeing the video of you making those, it seems pretty pretty intense, almost scientific in a way. How do you go about getting, because some of the bottoms are just kind of pristine almost, very smooth, very see-through almost. How do you get that, that process to work? I, I, like, I like the fact that you say that uh, almost scientific, but it means it was it really. It is. Fine. But I mean, but, but because um, uh, the making of uh, the making of casting of glass and casting of sugar is very similar, mm -hmm. but it's a very it's a very precise process of uh, from negative to positive to negative to positive, and and what it, I am always interesting is that casting glass and making of a uh, sugar uh, blocks is almost is almost the same way. You, you come from a, something that needs to be liquefied and then solidified very slow. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes grain again and then you dilute again with high temperature. Mm -hmm. So this is something very, very, very similar. And this was crystal sugar. You no, know, crystal sugar is something that we use. So the language, even in the language, is those similarity. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of time uh, to make it. And usually for pieces like, I mean, it's, uh, it's a painstaking time and, and uh, process. A lot of trial and error involved in it. Oh, definitely, definitely. But uh, but it's um, uh, and it's still, you know, I always thinking. I hope. It, I mean, the the work is not in my hand anymore. It's in a collection. But I always thinking that. Oh, I look at now. And I have new ideas. In many
try the Polaroid camera. And I have forgotten about the Polaroid camera. But I went and I started a body of work that was um, resulting to be an intriguing. And since then, it's a, we had, we, I found a perfect marriage. And I have done a lot of uh, work with it. Uh, there are many reasons about uh, a photograph. Uh, I always say that a photograph uh, have a, is a time material. It captures something of a time that passed immediately. But in the case of the uh, um, um, uh, 20 by 24 Polaroid, it's, a, it's an instant film. So it's allowed you, allowed me to do what I call performative photograph. It's no, it's no photograph that I'm going, uh, you know, documenting things that I found. But every photograph is a constructed art. It's, it's, it's a performance, a sculptural drawing, painterly gesture that I decide, you know, painting uh, that I'm trying to capture. So everything is really specific, a constructed tribute to, to be captured. This one, I was just thinking about the project that I was going to do for the Venice Biennale. Uh, and it was all involving about the entrapment of the body. So I found, I don't remember where this cage bird cage and uh, but it allowed me to do all these um, transitions and uh, almost like a what I say about it, it's almost like a, a steal from a much more larger narrative. Yeah it seems like it should be more uh, correct that is more a, that is that is allowed a space for other things that are going to come and going to happen. So yeah and I am very interested in the quality of the film the materiality is very it's very painterly mm -hmm. uh, in a way. And which do you prefer? Do you prefer the installations or do you prefer No, I don't have preference in my work. I usually uh, use the media that better uh, refer and better embody ideas that I have in, my, in the particular moment. So I just have this uh, hybrid practice and this kind of a transitioning from one media to another as, as I need it. The piece that is behind this wall mm -hmm. is a watercolor, a, what do you call or mixed media with gouache, with ink, with pencil, with hair? Everything. Okay. Okay. Well, um, two more questions. Uh, this one's pretty simple. What's next for you? What do you have coming up next after this one? Um, Anything in the works? You are, you are invited. Uh, May 14, I will be performance, doing a performance. I will be performing at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, okay. Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, with my partner and husband and a number of other people that have been collaborating. Uh, June 4, I have a, a new exhibition opening at the uh, Alabama uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And July 4, I have a show uh, opening in Milano, in Italy. And then I'm working for a number of new projects in, in, in Europe and other places. And I just finished a major uh, new exhibition at uh, Peabody Essex Museum in Boston uh, with a piece that was entitled Alchemy of the Soul, Elixir for the Spirits, and quite a large new commission. And so, yeah, I'm busy. A lot. Yeah, definitely. All right, and a uh, final question, I do this for all the artists that come in. Uh, the best bit of advice that you receive, whether it be from a fellow artist, family member, anything that kind of helped you along the way, what would that be? Uh, I have been very lucky with advice. Uh, I have a, a family who totally trusts my intent, and a mother who pushed me through everything and always, anytime that I have a flaky leg or something, say, you could do it. You could do it. And I was very, very lucky to have an extraordinary teacher from very early on in my life. Uh, a very young, uh, when I was very young, I have a professor, a, a, a teacher, elementary school, Carmen Lidia Escobar Menendez, who was very important in me becoming an artist. And then, later I met Antonio Vidal, who saw me when I was 15 years old and told me, you are a good artist. You could be the women artist that I always dreamed to have. And this guy was so important and so instrumental uh, in my life. So I, I think that I, these are people that uh, trust me, believe me, uh, I come from a family of extraordinary people, extraordinary women and men. Uh, my father, when I, the first time that I did a plastered uh, 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 model, it was, uh, it, it was very young in my career, and I brought it to my hometown. And my father, at that time, his mode of transportation was a horse. He put me, uh, my plastered scene, 
and in the horse with self, and he went every house in the village telling people, my daughter, I want to show you the monument that my daughter is doing. So you had a manager at like so, a very age. A very, very happy manager. So, and, and that, I, you know, I, I, am, I teach for many years, and that's what I tell my students, you know, you, you, you stick with you, what you believe that is important, and you listen to people who want to be helpful to you. Uh, one thing is to have commitment and, and believe in something, but be flexible with the, what people is telling you, no? And that is, that is the key. You don't give up. Just keep going. You, you keep working, you keep working, and when you think that every door maybe is closed, something is just about to open. So. I like that. And that'll do it. I want to thank you again for doing the interview with us. My pleasure. Thank you no for problem. having me. No problem at all.